So before we get started, I'd like to introduce Cece Wei, who is the Director of Programs at Open News, where she envisions and executes transformative initiatives for journalism, especially for journalists of color and local journalists. Previously, she was Assistant Managing Editor at ProPublica, where she oversaw and edited news apps, graphics, visual reporting, and investigations. Thank you for joining us, Cece. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you uh, for that great introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I also have uh, this crazy tech setup that we just made up just now. So if I'm ever looking down, it's because I'm trying to read your chats. Um, but uh, welcome everybody. Um, my talk today is, uh, as it says, it's gonna be about how data has transformed journalism, both on the inside and on the outside. Um, and if you want to follow along with the presentation, I'm going to paste this into the chat as well so that you can flip through the slides with me. Um, the other thing is that all the screenshots that I'm going to be using later on, they're all clickable. So if you are going through the keynote and you're like, oh, I really want to know more about that project, just go to the slides and click on the URL and I'll take you right there. So um, let's get started. All right. All right, so um, as you all know by now, I'm Cece. Um, I thought I would actually start with um, a unrelated uh, share just because we're in this kind of crazy time in that uh, one of the things I've been doing a lot lately is spending a lot of time doing art sort of as my therapy as a way of getting through this. And so I wanted to hear um, and I also wanted to say that this is my first CSV comp. I've been wanting to come for many years. I was really excited that I would actually be able to come this year. Um, and I'm even more thrilled that the organizers were able to put this online and to bring us all together anyway. Um, and I actually wanted to ask all of you if you would show the organizers some love by putting some emojis in the chat right now because they've done such an awesome job transporting this physical conference into a digital one and supporting the speakers, many of whom, like myself, have never presented in this literal environment before. So um, thank you to the organizers um, and thank you for folks for putting things in the chat. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is I wanted to sort of thank all of you for being here because it is a hard time to focus right now. And that's a lot of the work that Open News has been doing, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but just helping people get through this time. And I know attending a talk um, when there isn't a craziness happening in the world right now uh, is very different than attending a talk uh, at a time in which many people are stuck at home or worried about loved ones. So thank you for being here. Um, I've really enjoyed the morning session so far, and I kind of feel like I've like discovered some more of my people, um, just hearing uh, like Angela talking about building data communities, which is really close to my heart. And then the multiple talks on open data, how to grow, how to support each other through an inclusive research and coding culture. That stuff is really exciting to me right now. Um, and that's also because most of my life in my career in journalism, this is sort of my path. I think this is the right direction. So I was a journalist first. Uh, I came out of college wanting to do journalism, but I didn't have any idea of actually how transformative it would be for me because I ended up also falling in love with coding and with data. And I wanted to merge all of those things together to tell stories in a different way. Um, and then over the last couple of years, I spent some time as an editor. So that in journalism means that you are both literally helping people write better words and tell their stories um, and make them sort of the best, help them do the best work they could possibly do. Um, but then on the other hand, also trying to be a good manager and trying to figure out what does that mean? How can I be there for people? Um, and then a common thread throughout all of my work is sort of a real close to my heart part of it is about diversity and equity and inclusion everywhere we work and um, how important that is to me, um, and especially now during COVID-19. Um, and so we'll be talking about that a lot later on and how that is interwoven with hiring. Um, and this is also, also ultimately a talk about something I wanted to look more deeply into for a long time. I've been there 
in the journalism and data journalism communities feeling this change, feeling that with these skills and an increased number of people working in journalism with these skills, that there isn't change. And so now um, I'm hoping to both with this talk and with um, a good amount of work in the next couple of weeks and months to really dig into it. All right, so um, two places I wanted to highlight really quick so you understand my background. ProPublica, for those of you who don't know it, is an investigative nonprofit newsroom. When I started there eight years ago, it was about 30 people. When I left this January, I think it was almost, if not already 200 people total. So it's been an insane ride, um, really amazing for me. And it has really sort of um, been a place that has given me almost three different types of jobs and the ability to learn both how to do the data journalism work uh, how to manage a team that does that work, and then how to both communicate, collaborate, and make it sort of a seamless part of uh, the entire body of work that is journalism. Uh, and then this February, I started at Open News, uh, which for those of you who don't know, is a community-driven community support organization that tries to marry journalists and technologists who are doing this work together. And so, this is some language that we've been working on recently, just about like what, what is at the heart of open news right now? Um, and I think this really puts it pretty well, which is that we're here currently to support a movement in journalism. And um, people are doing this, we wanna be there for them and we wanna help catalyze their work. And it's all centered around newsrooms being equitable, inclusive and collaborative, which is really key. And then also the communities that are involved, that journalism is trying to serve, that they can um, once again, really trust journalism to have their backs um, and to represent them. So that's sort of the core values. We've been talking a lot about values today uh, of what Open News is really here for. And, uh, and I see a lot of love in the chat for these organizations, thank you. Um, and so this is our community here, journalists slash technologists. And even at the beginning of the talk, I was talking about how data has changed everything, right? Data, I use it almost as a shorthand because when I talk about how it's changed journalism, in this journalism slash technology community, it means so many different interconnected things. So as an example, I started my career as a graphics editor at the Washington Post. The skills that I used there were front end development, design, and my journalism skills. And so I made graphics, I did data visualization, whether it was on the Olympics or the election. But then I also wanted to do some data analysis, right? Uh, data collection, and I wanted to do some backend database programming. I kind of had an interest in almost everything full stack. And so when I went to ProPublica, I was called a news apps developer, right? And all these titles, uh, when you're really in the community, you know what they all mean, but on a generic level, uh, it's just this journalism slash technology uh, type of job. And as a news apps developer, I did everything from beginning to end. Um, and that included, right, collecting the data, cleaning the data, trying to find some insight that I would then go do some journalism on uh, by interviewing people. Uh, and then if it turns out it's like a wealth of data that people would love to sift through, then you build the backend database, then you design the front end UX for all the people who are gonna sift through it that don't know anything about the data already, and then writing your story. And that was like a ton of stuff. Um, and so we also frequently work and collaborate with other people in the newsroom so that you are not the only one doing literally everything, though I did that a couple of times and I loved it, um, but I'm also very happy that I'm not doing everything anymore. <laughs> so. That's sort of an example. There's a lot of different titles, but we're just looking at people who are working in journalism and they've got data design coding skills uh, and they're trying to do their journalism that way. Okay, so then this is something that we say a lot at Open News, uh, that journalists and technologists are uniquely positioned to change journalism. It's a field, right, that is already great at digging for stories and at writing really compelling narratives to tell those stories. So then the question is, what happens, and now we have over 10 years to look at, what happens when you build into journalism 
the skills and the tools that are available from the data community, the tech community, and the open source community. So here's, I'm gonna show you three changes. So here's change number one, better journalism. Um, and this is probably the most uh, well trodden space in terms of how does data and technology improve journalism itself. I could spend our entire hour together in this section. I'm only going to give you one walkthrough of an example. Um, but if you want to know more about this, I can share loads of resources that you can read about almost any specific project or group of projects. So please let me know if that's interesting. Um, and uh, the one thing that I'll share for folks, obviously many of you who are not following along in what journalism uh, communities are doing is that something that's always rung true in the data journalism community, this is more than 10 years ago, right? Is that if you can marry your data skills uh, and then oftentimes your technology skills in order to use your data skills um, with your journalism, there are many cases in which you will no longer need to take all your experts at their word because they should be able to show you and have you be able to reproduce the data itself and show you essentially the proof in the pudding, right? So that's what it really enables journalists to do, to take these critical views of what's going on and demand to see the proof, as opposed to uh, have to deal with just a statement, which we do in many areas of journalism still. Okay, so here's my better journalism example. Um, this is a piece that I edited last year um, by three very talented journalists and it was a larger collaboration um, with ProPublica's local reporting network. Basically, ProPublica has this program where they wanna help local journalists do hard hitting investigative work, but they don't wanna parachute in. So what they do is they pay for the salary of a staff person who's already at the organization so that the local newsroom can backfill and have someone do sort of the demands of the day-to-day -day job so that somebody on their staff can actually focus on doing an investigation and an investigative series for a whole year. And so this is one piece in a much larger package um, in which ProPublica partnered with The Advocate and The Times-Picayune in New Orleans to look at this part of Louisiana that is so notorious for being polluted that people just call it Cancer Alley. Um, and once I sort of knew that for the story, I started seeing it everywhere, like in um, novels that I was reading, even in fiction. Uh, I, I don't even remember what it was, but it was like two days after I was editing the story, I was reading this book and they were like, oh yeah, I'm in a truck driving through Cancer Alley. And I was like, wow, okay, this is really well known. Um, and so then the problem, right, as journalists that we're looking at is why are more chemical plants still being approved to be built in this area? Questions that we wanna know answers to are what's going on, how much pollutants are in the air, what is the difference these new plants are gonna make, how do they get approved? Okay, so um, in addition to some great on the ground reporting, uh, two journalists, Layla Youngs um, and Al Shaw, um, both were on the news apps team at ProPublica um, and they both worked hand in hand with an expert researcher and they were looking at an EPA data model that estimates the concentration of chemical pollutants in the air that are specifically coming from these chemical plants in the area. So in the map that you see right now, the red gradation is the level of air toxicity specifically from cancer causing chemicals that are being emitted. The really tiny gray dots, those are just the plants that are already built. There's over 200 of them. The purple dots are the new plants that are already approved and will be built. And the orange ones are the ones that are still pending approval um, at the time that we did this piece. And we had a source tell us that there are no permits that are pending approval that have, that to their recollection, have ever been rejected. So we can pretty much assume that they're gonna get built. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you sort of two things that are part of this massive project that we learned. One example is in this specific area um, of the Cancer Alley section. Um, I'm gonna explain what the colors mean because you don't have the benefit of going through the whole walkthrough of the presentation. The blue gradient on the land, that shows uh, how predominantly black the residents are 
in a given district, right? So you can see in the lower left, that area is predominantly black. And then there's this little slice over on the right, this little shape um, that is not only not predominantly black, it is also predominantly white. Okay, so um, I wonder if I can actually move my mouse. Can you, yeah, you can see my mouse. So this area right here, um, what you already know when you get to this part of the story is that a new plant is moving in and that plant is going to double the, the toxic air emissions in this entire area. And what we found looking at this, right, is that uh, every single one of these shapes uh, all represent plants that have been approved and will be moving in, right? And they're all going to be emitting chemicals, but you don't see any right here. So we looked into it um, and what we basically found out is that there's actually these two uh, plant complexes that originally wanted to move in, one inside of the predominantly white district and one across the river from it. And the district council, those were the only two plants that they barred from actually building. And you kind of see the quote that we got from a council member um, on the slide. Uh, but that was sort of something that really, I don't wanna say shocked us, but we didn't know that it would be this crystal clear of a difference given how many on the previous slide you can see different plants are moving in all over and around the river. So that's one example. Uh, the second example though, and this is another aspect of being able to bring your data skills in, right, is that as Layla and Al digged further, they actually realized that the local regulatory agency has a really interesting way of regulating their chemical emissions. They only regulate whether the level of each individual pollutant separate from the other ones, they make sure that those levels do not violate state law individually. So they don't look at the cumulative risk of multiple cancer causing chemicals being emitted from the same place. And so Entergy, um, you can see on the map where that is supposed to be built. And these are their projections for the levels of air toxicity given each of their cancer causing chemicals. So this is just looking at one at a time, which is what the regulated uh, the regulators would be looking at when they're trying to decide, is this an acceptable level? But then we were also able to, on top of that, show you, okay, but there's also a second chemical that is also cancer causing. This is what the cumulative air toxicity looks like. And then finally, obviously this is not the first and only plant that exists in this area, this is what actual, actual cumulative air toxicity looks like if you consider emissions from every other plant that's already there and whether or not those uh, chemicals are gonna travel to this area. And so we also found that when toxicity reaches these levels, um, it's done so in other states as well, like it did in Illinois, and the Illinois EPA actually shut the plants down. But in this case, in Louisiana, it's totally legal, totally okay. Um, and so just to share something so it's not all depressing news, um, after the investigation, there's still more follow-up now. Louisiana did decide that they wanted to commission a detailed study on cancer rates in the area. There's also, I feel like I've gone over maybe 25% um, of the journalism in this project. So if you want to know more about it, I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, Okay, so that's what I mean by better journalism, right? There's so many different aspects of what's going on there. There's the visualization, there's the understanding of how to be critical about data processes, and then third, the use of data itself. Um, so that's change number one, better journalism. Here's change number two. So this is collaboration on an entirely new level. And especially as we talk about the open source community and uh, the tech community, even earlier, um, the R community, and how everyone is really collaborative in terms of helping each other. This is something that has grown, I think, exponentially in journalism. So here is a really easy example. Um, so this is the website Source. It's one that we publish at Open News. The whole point of Source is essentially to share knowledge, and we publish articles that help journalists help each other. This was something that was published, I think, last week. May 8th was last week, I think. Um, and it's a story recipe. Basically, as local journalists are doing their own stories or national journalists are doing their own stories, they collect all this data, they analyze it, and they can only do so many stories out of that data set when 
journalists all over the country would be able to use this slice of it or this slice of it to specifically tackle a story about their community. And so we invite them and we pay them um, to write a story that walks you through exactly how to do it and then tells you how to customize it for your area, how to analyze the data and then what questions to ask. Um, and to show you a fun example as well, in this one, there's literally the R code that you can copy um, and commented through how it all works. And then we also do this, uh, the same thing. The article has uh, Google Sheets instructions so that if you don't know how to use R, you can still figure it out with us. Um, and so this is something that um, is a quote. I don't know who to attribute to, attribute it to, but I know is said in the community a lot, which is, you know, journalism is a competitive place, right? People are trying to break news first. They're trying to get their news organization or themselves recognition as the experts on something. But when there's so many stories to cover, what we can obviously do is collaborate on the tech, compete on the stories, um, help each other do our journalism better, and just compete when it comes to figuring out what's actually going on in our communities and making sure that we are reporting on it respectfully, accurately. So um, Source is definitely not the only place doing this. Um, these are four of the eight story recipes that we have published recently just on COVID. Um, but other organizations, for example, where I used to work, ProPublica, they call them reporting recipes. Every time we came out with a huge news app even, we would walk reporters through how to use it, how do you use it to report on your local area. Um, and so it's uh, something that more and more journalists are doing, um, and especially when you have data as that kernel, as your kickoff point, because I can't write a story about every row of data. It's just not humanly possible. Um, but journalists across the country could write a lot more stories collectively. And then I wanted to highlight a couple of other pro uh, projects as well that really show collaboration on a different level, not just teaching each other how to write stories, but actually coming together to do big projects. So this is the COVID tracking project. It uh, was, um, I, I even hesitate to say incubated. I feel like it was kicked off at the Atlantic. And then more and more journalists started to volunteer their time to put this together so that there was at least one complete data source available. Um, and these people do it on a volunteer basis. Um, they work at all different parts of journalism and they provide this to other people for free, data journalists or anyone else who wants this information. Another instance, um, Big Local News is a organization run out of Stanford University, um, and they're also all about sharing data so that journalists can use it. They also made this um, fantastic case mapper so that local journalists, if you don't have those front end skills or don't want to do it yourself, you can embed this uh, for your local area and just put it on your site which um, embedding graphics and making graphics so they're embeddable for local journalists is not a new concept. It's something that's been going on for many years now. Um, and this is sort of the latest iteration of it. And then also this newsroom guide to COVID-19. And I wanted to share this because this is also collaborative, people working at different places. Um, but its focus, right, is not solely on data, but also as you can see things like, let's take care of ourselves. Um, and how do we take care of one another, which um, I really appreciate. Uh, and then finally, so this is collaboration at a massive scale. Everything before is much smaller in comparison, uh, which is I wanted to highlight two rather famous examples of major journalism collaborations. The first one is the Panama Papers. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar with this, uh, it started at ICIJ, which stands for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. They worked with over 100 media partners they sifted through over 11 million leaked files. Um, and it was all about exposing offshore holdings of world political leaders, of uh, details of hidden financial dealings, of drug traffickers, billionaires, celebrities. It was probably, I think, the biggest leak of inside information in history. And in order to parse this, they couldn't do it by themselves. Um, and so, I wanted to show this quote from their site, which is just that they indexed, organized, and analyzed 2.6 terabytes of data that made up a leak. And that leak is like not just data, right? It's like PDFs and um, memos and emails as well. 
And then they used collaborative platforms to communicate and then share those documents with journalists working in 25 languages in nearly 80 countries. Um, and that I think is just, um, has been really incredible. It has spurred a lot of investigations, uh, a lot of impact, and then ultimately resulting in this effort getting a Pulitzer Prize in 2017, um, which was really incredible. And then the other example like of you as well is something that um, Scott Klein, my previous boss at ProPublica, um, thought of and then orchestrated a project called Election Land. And what's interesting about Election Land is that it's about covering the election on the day of, not in terms of results, but making sure that people um, who run into problems on voting day, journalists can report on it fast enough to make a difference so that maybe you'll still be able to vote. So when it comes to things like voter intimidation, cybersecurity issues, voter suppression, all of that, right, across the US on election day, can we get tips to journalists in those places fast enough so they can report on it, publish, and then impact change before polls close? Um, and so uh, I think election land, I don't remember how many times it's been done, at least twice, if not three times, happening again in 2020. But in 2018, there were more than 120 local and national newsrooms that participated in the country getting real-time tips. And in total, there was more than 230 stories published. So this is sort of what it means now um, when it comes to massive, like anywhere from micro to uh, major invest collaborative journalism efforts in, um, in the industry. And a lot of it, most of it uses data in order to power that. So that's change number two, massive collaboration. And then finally, change number three is, this is what I mean by inside and out. So making the journalism industry a better place to work. Um, this is something that uh, I'm gonna break into three parts for you. Um, First one is unions. So, um, you know, unions have been around for an incredibly long time. Data journalism cannot um, take any credit for their existence in any way. Um, we have learned an incredible amount from them. But what's been really fun to see on my end is that a lot of the newest union-based um, pay and equity studies have been led by, and the data analysis has been done by people who are data reporters on the editorial side of the newsroom, right? So uh, this was in 2018, um, a pay study by the union of the Los Angeles Times. Um, I have their findings on there. You can check this stuff out. Um, but this uh, was led by Anthony Pesk, who is a data journalist and a reporter on the data desk. Um, and there's a more recent example as well um, I think this was just last year, the Washington Post Union also did a study of pay, also finding that women of color in the newsroom are making less money. Um, and this was led by Stephen Rich, uh, who is an investigative data journalist at the Washington Post. Um, and in the full spirit of everything we've been talking about today, in addition to doing the study, he then open sourced the techniques and the code to do it. Um, and not only is there a IPython notebook version, there's also a R version that you can walk through if you wanna do the same thing. Um, and so that's really cool. Um, but I also don't wanna just highlight large places. There's also examples like this, um, where Katie Gillespie, um, an education and data reporter at the Columbian, which is in Vancouver, uh, Washington, also sort of uh, was part of the union organizing effort for their local newsroom, right? And so I think we're really only seeing um, the merge of these two communities come together and really build on each other. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say about this too is that there are a lot of other data journalists, especially as I was reporting out this part of the presentation, who have led pay studies um, either at their organization or at their union, and the findings aren't public um, to all of us, but they were brought to management, right? And so they're also, um, as always, um, more quiet uh, moments of change that are happening. Um, and obviously this is all on top of work that unions have been doing for a long time. The major change that I'm seeing now is that instead of needing to pay a consulting group to look at the data that the employer gives you, you now have in-house talent and in-house um, 
skills inside of your bargaining unit that know how to do this and that really know the people involved and know the organization thoroughly because they work there. And that's kind of incredible. Okay, so then the second part of uh, making newsrooms better is through hiring policies and diversity reports. So um, I just wanna say before I show you uh, what I'm gonna highlight, it's not comprehensive of a timeline, but what I would like to highlight is newer journalism companies, and by newer I mean probably created in the last decade or so, whose data and graphic staff were really integral uh, to creating diversity reports that are available and geared towards the public, which is the people who read the journalism, as opposed to geared towards like um, your board or stakeholders or something like that. And after doing as much research as I could, um, I felt like there were only around 10 total news organizations that even have something like that that's publishable, right? Meeting that criteria, Name, meaning that it's not buried like in a PDF report that you kind of have on the side on your site, but that you really treat like another piece of journalism on your website so that the public can find it and actually read it. And so here is the beginning, I think, of it all, uh, which is in 2014. Um, a lot of you will probably also remember that it follows the same trend as when technology companies were reporting their diversity reports for the first time. And um, BuzzFeed was the first journalism organization to do it. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because BuzzFeed's origin story really was about being a tech company that does journalism, right? Um, and after talking to some folks, I also found out for sure that it was their data science team that was looking at and analyzing the data to make the report possible. But that was sort of already embedded in their company culture and still is, right? That they use data to, um, make a lot of their decisions and it's really important to them. Uh, I was at ProPublica at the time, so the next year following their example, ProPublica published their first one and now in 2020 the fifth one has come out, right, they're done annually and um, in this case Lana Groger and I were both news apps developers um, and part of the kickoff for this was that we were like, hey, you know, um, we should do this we're currently not tracking as a company in any way the demographics of the staff and we should give people an opt-in way to self-identify and then report on it for the public um, especially when our journalism is so centered around uh, fighting injustices right and we want to know what the makeup of the staff is like and so we were able to sort of um, create that data set and then analyze it and then visualize it and put it up in a report um, more places have followed suit. Um, the Marshall Project, their diversity report uh, also was prompted and started um, with a group of people, uh, including a data journalist on their staff, um, as well as the city, which is a, compared to all the other organizations, the newest, um, which launched uh, to be a organization that really serves and covers the people of New York City. Um, and this diversity report was also uh, led by a data journalist there. And so um, the one last thing I'll say is that I'm certain there are backstories that I don't know about because I couldn't interview every organization that had come out with a diversity report before this talk. Um, but uh, they were definitely, I feel like there's definitely something that I saw and I wanna keep researching about how these, having these inherent data skills in house, right? Are enabling organizations to look at themselves much more critically and from maybe a safer place um, because their staff is trying to work with the company to try and be transparent with their readers. Um, okay, and then here's, here's like a sad, a sadder point, right? Which is that um, the work of collecting diversity and demographic data in journalism is not new. Um, there is this diversity census called ASNE, um, or ASNE is the organization, um, but they've been doing this diversity census for over 40 years. And um, news organizations just report to them and then they put out an aggregate, aggregated sort of report uh, every year and participation rates have been so slow in recent years that ASNE decided that it wasn't worth doing the diversity census anymore, which um, is really sad 
for me. Um, and there's a long list of major news organizations that all of you will have heard of that don't participate. Um, no one requires that they do. Um, and uh, even when listed publicly, it doesn't sort of have any effect. And so you're sort of seeing these two, two different things happening simultaneously, which is data journalism bringing in more public facing diversity reports while journalism as a whole is sort of um, regressing when it comes to how willing they are even to report their own numbers. So very interesting. <laughs> and then finally, so uh, I love this example though. Uh, I wanted to merge the two, right? Unions and diversity reports, marrying them together. One last example, which is that um, at the intercept, um, they are a um, they are also an investigative nonprofit. Um, you can learn more about them as well. They're also a relatively new organization. But what's really interesting about the intercept is that they, as a union, decided that diversity was the most important thing to them. And so in their actual union contract, there are diversity agreements, um, which I think is different, right, than a diversity committee or some people on staff getting certain things published, right? This is a sort of second level um, agreement. Um, and they had a first of its kind diversity provision that uh, requires that when people who are interviewing, when people interview for the bargaining unit jobs, that at least two people of color have to be interviewed um, at that stage, right? So those kind of rules aren't new, but the fact that it's part of a union agreement has never happened before, at least um, to the knowledge, to my knowledge in journalism. Um, and the contract itself, right, has that. I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. Um, but then the contract also created their diversity committee. And it includes the fact that managers have to come and they have to discuss um, issues that uh, affect their staff, affect traditionally underrepresented people in journalism. Um, and that also sort of includes creating this demographic survey. It also includes discussions for how to allocate resources to address this kind of thing. So I think that was really cool, just sort of bringing all that kind of stuff together. So these changes, as we've talked about, right, um, going back to my original statement about journalists and technologists being uniquely positioned to change journalism for all these reasons, um, both when it comes to coverage and when it comes to the makeup and the process and the culture of uh, what it's like inside of newsrooms. Um, and so I think my conclusion so far is that they're doing it one step at a time. They're creating change, bringing change. Um, and, uh, you know, we've gone through these various ways that attempts are being made, um, even at a time in journalism that is really difficult right now, just like in many different industries um, with people going through pay cuts, people going through furloughs, um, this work and the work of the unions that I showed you before are still moving forward to try to do the best that they can um, to help keep their newsroom sort of a fair and equitable place. Um, and so, let's see, yeah. So um, the one thing I wanna say here is that if you're in journalism and you're listening to this talk and you wanna make these types of changes in your organization, and you wanna talk about it, I would love to talk to you. But similarly, um, and I think this is more the case for the people at CSVConf, is that if you're in another industry and you want to sort of take some of these things that journalism is doing and apply it yourself, I know that um, in different industries, there are definitely different types of challenges for which things are harder and which things are easier. But I would love to learn more about what you're doing, what you want to do. And if I can help sort of bounce ideas, I think that would be fantastic. Um, so these are all the different ways to contact me. Um, and uh, I think I spoke significantly fast, faster than I planned. So we have time to do questions live, I think. So thank you, Stacey. Um, how do you want to handle questions? Uh, do you, are you able to access to ask a question? Yeah. In the future, or do you want me to? Read through them for uh, you. I'm happy to um, let me see if I can just. I think there's three in there right now, so mm -hmm. I think I can just read them and then go through them. Does that sound good? That's 
It's great to me. All right. Okay, cool. Okay, so the first one, question from, oh, okay, I see. They move when you all vote on them. <laughs> so let me, um, okay, I, I feel like I maybe will be able to keep track of this. So, okay, first question is story recipes sound really amazing. I'm curious what kind of usage you're seeing on them. Do people let you know when they use it? Or do you have another way to know that it's enabled someone to report and analyze the data? So this is a really great question because um, Open News had published story recipes in the past, but not as frequently as we are doing now. And so we're actually in the middle of trying to figure this out. Um, we currently don't ask for anything because um, our the like center value that we're trying to hold here is that you don't need to pay anything, whether that's in registration or personal data or anything in order to access this stuff. And so we don't we don't have a guaranteed way of knowing. Um, there's no like uh, code that you have to embed if you publish with it. Um, but we are thinking about ways that we can ask the community to tell us because we have heard anecdotally that people use it, report on something, and then they publish. Like sometimes people will proactively tell us that. Other times they'll say they looked into it, but it didn't work out. Um, but the third case, which is really interesting, is that some people look at it and they use it not to report uh, on the story recipe, but just to learn the techniques that the authors went through in getting to that story. And so that's also really cool. Um, I also know that the way that we had done it at ProPublica is that we just sort of, it's a similar thing. There's a little blurb that says, if you use this, we'd love to know, we'd love to promote it, send it to us. And so sometimes when people would do that, we would accumulate all the links and then we would have a little section on the site for that project that says local stories that were written. And then we would show all of them, which is like a good way of motivating people to share the links back. But we're still trying to figure out how to really thoroughly look at this at Open News. Um, okay, next question. Uh, okay, so this is a question from Jennifer. I know data sources. I think I see local stories in the data. What can I do? I'm not a writer. How to connect with a journalist or interest in generating a new local journalist? Um, I think, um, Jennifer, I see you in the chat. I'm gonna ask you a quick question to clarify, which is I think what you're asking is, I know how to use the data and I'm interested in contributing to this work, but I'm not a writer right now. How do I either collaborate with a local journalist or do my own work? Is that what you're asking? Yes, no, yes, no in the chat, perhaps. <laughs> While I'm waiting for that, I can go ahead and just answer that version of the question because I think that's right. Um, I think that if you're really data savvy, you can definitely sort of look at what local newsrooms exist in your um, space. So uh, whether that means geographically or if there's um, an area of expertise that you have um, that isn't in your geography, but a newsroom is sort of based there, I think that you could um, totally uh, look at if they're doing any data stories already, usually people will have something like the word data in their title or their biography. Um, but the other thing is you should also feel free if you wanna just chat me in the CSV comp Slack with sort of like your location or if you wanna brainstorm a little bit, there are a lot of places where data journalists hang out. Um, and so uh, there's sort of easy ways to get in contact with folks if you wanna work together on something. And then, okay, next question. Uh, oh, it shifted again. Okay, I'll do these in the vote order as well as they shift. But um, okay, one of the criticisms for requiring representation among job candidates is that it can be inherently othering, especially when the people slash committee doing hiring isn't trained to confront their biases and understand the higher bars that are set for oppressed groups. Are there also requirements for inclusivity training and practices to accompany interviewing? For contacts in academia, we often hear about requirements for URMs in the interview pool who end up not being seriously considered. Okay, so this is a question from Hal. It's 100% on point. So if all you do is follow that rule and nothing else, it could be a total disaster. Like um, uh, for all of the reasons that are stated in the question. 
All I can tell you is what my sort of recommendations or things that I've seen work gradually. Um, one is that to communicate to people that with this rule, uh, the spirit of it is that a inherent understanding that it isn't that people of color uh, who are qualified to this job don't exist, which is sort of like one layer of um, very um, most like mostly when people are at the very beginning stages of understanding how this works and confronting their own biases, that's like the first layer, right? People think, well, like I would hire people of color, but they're just not qualified. And to establish that's just not true, the key is that you are not finding them, right? And so the question is like, why are you not finding them? Or why are they not interested in working here? And so this bar of having at least one or two or however many more um, you want to say of finalists who are POCs is, is that if you cannot find two of them who would do a great job at this, then you are not done with your applicant pool stage of your job hiring process. Like you just haven't done a good job as an organization and sort of framing it that way. I think that step two, step three definitely includes things like how do you then conduct the interviews better, including how do you make sure that people are asking all sort of hitting all the same points on their questions? How do you make sure that people aren't just like trying to connect um, purely on stories, uh, like personal stories about where you've worked before? Because then institutional biases can just sort of like keep rolling into each other. Um, and then there's also, you know, like the question mentioned inclusivity training, um, though I've personally never been able to study those up close in terms of being a part of one and then seeing how it affects the staff. Um, but I think it's an area that I'm definitely really interested in. Um, okay, next question is, oh, and any questions that I don't read out loud, I will answer them in the chat. So please don't worry about that. Um, what is your perspective on using data to form narratives more responsibly in journalism? especially when there's potential for transforming industries slash social issues. Yeah, so this is from Selena. Um, I think that you have to be, um, <laughs> you have to be really good at your job. And what I mean by that is that as journalists, right, um, if you wanna do your job well, you have to have, I mean, um, some words to borrow from my predecessors who have already given talks this morning. You have to have empathy for your community you have to do your job and understand the types of things that they are going through. You have to report out what does it mean to be respectful when it's not um, your own monoculture that you're in, right? And that we're in a blend of different cultures um, and journalism, and we've seen it before. Um, and there's an example I can give too, is that one of the local reporting network partners, um, from over the last year and also this year who ended up winning a Pulitzer um, this year, which is really great. They're based in Alaska. And one of the things that some of the engagement reporters at ProPublica did when they were trying to fully understand the community they were covering, which was on a really hard topic, um, which is about sort of the like sexual harassment and rape of women in remote locations that have no, um, no police protection um, or even physical access to a rape kit, right? And one of the things that the community was telling our engagement reporters over and over again is that however long ago journalism comes in, writes a story about this, and then the entire community is branded by this one thing. And that's all they're ever known for. Um, and journalism has a responsibility for that to understand the implications of their actions on multiple levels and to tell stories in a way, because it's possible to do so, to tell stories in a way that um, don't sort of scar a community forever, right? Um, so I think that, oh, I have 10 minutes left. Um, I think that data is sort of like one component to making sure that you understand what's going on, but then you absolutely have to talk to the people involved, especially if it's not a community that you're already part of to fully understand what's going on. Um, and that's sort of, you know, the, the flip side of really good traditional journalism helps you accomplish that. Um, let's see. 
Oh, this one's fun. Um, I would love to know how any tips on how to interview your data to find unique stories. Um, the um, interview in quotes, I don't know why you put it in quotes, but um, it's really uh, appropriate because uh, one of the first people who I uh, learned data journalism from, Derek Willis, who works at ProPublica, um, and I ended up editing for a couple of years, had always talked about when we work with data as journalists, what we're doing is interviewing them. Uh, pretend like they're a human being and ask them what you wanna know. So if you have a data set um, that is about schools or test scores or votes for representatives, like if you had a human being with all that knowledge in your head, what would you ask them? Um, and I think that's a really fun way of thinking about it because then you'll quickly realize like, oh, maybe my data can't answer this question. And if that's the case, you'll know that you need to combine data sets or um, maybe uh, what I find often is when I do that, I realize something is missing and then I go back to the entity that gave me the data and I'm like, why is this not here? Are you withholding it from me or what's going on? Because it wouldn't make sense without this information. Um, but if you wanna know more, um, I can uh, I can try to maybe pop in some resources because there's a lot written, I think both by Derek and by other folks who teach data journalism, how, how journalists can think about data as a source in that way. So I'll drop something in the Slack. Um, and then, okay, we have two left. So I think I can get to all of them. As a designer and technologist, how do I level up my journalism and get involved in news apps development? Um, from John. So uh, this is a great question. Um, designer, uh, design and technology skills are really great to have as a backbone. Um, I find that from a super broad stroke point of view, whenever I've taught folks who come from that background who wanna come into journalism, which is what Open News um, facilitated for a long time before I worked there, uh, is that the scariest thing for people who don't come from a journalism background is calling strangers to ask them whatever questions you wanna ask. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Like in normal day-to-day -day life, um, most professions do not require that skill. Um, and it's a very social-based skill. Um, and uh, I think the thing that I would say is I would start out with a topic that you're really passionate about that's, that's not super high stakes. So to give you an example, um, remember that show we all used to really like called Game of Thrones until the last season happened? Well, so um, the Washington Post had this great piece that they did on it that was just literally tracking every death per episode that had happened across every single season, right? So that's some data and design. And if you're really into the topic, you will be really into this, right? And then depending on what you wanna ask, try to figure out like, what do I wanna know more about? What do I wanna confirm? Um, and get some practice sort of just uh, attempting to ask for other people's time to tell you some information. Um, and practice wise, that's what I would start with. Um, if you really wanna get into the profession, you can totally like, uh, if you wanna check out uh, NICAR, which I can put in the chat here, that's where a lot of um, data journalists hang out. It's a conference, but it's also a listserv that anyone can join for free, understanding that it's a bunch of journalists. So if you say something there, like it's gonna be on the record, um, but it's a great place, especially for new people to get started, including students um, and people are really happy to help there. Um, yeah, uh, let's see, here we go. Next question. Um, Let's see, any any newsrooms in Europe that are known to utilize data in a powerful way? Um, so, oh yeah, and then um, folks, yes, yeah, so Guardian and BBC, absolutely fantastic. Um, depending on what country you're in, you might have more familiarity, uh, but um, the other thing that I would say is uh, the organization that won the Pulitzer for the Panama Papers, um, ICIJ, they're based internationally in Europe. Um, and that was probably one of the most powerful uses of data <laughs> I've seen. Uh, the other thing is um, in Germany, um, 
I think uh, at Der Spiegel and he, Julian used to work at um, the Berliner, Berliner Morgan Post as well. He is um, absolute powerhouse in this uh, kind of work. Um, there is a ton of different organizations also in Norway and Sweden. Um, I would say if you're really, uh, if you want kind of like a shortcut to figure out places that are doing really good work, in Europe, uh, I actually go to um, so the Society of News Design. Um, so that is a professional organization in journalism that is specifically for journalists who are also designers. And they have a, a competition every year for the best of digital. And they show you the organizations that win medals. And I often use that as, a, as like a shortcut to look at um, places that are doing amazing work uh, across the globe, um, not just in Europe, and both the print and the digital competitions are absolutely amazing. They have data visualization categories, which often leads you to the same people who are doing the viz or the same team, essentially, that's doing the visualization as well as the data analysis. So that's, um, that's where I would go to check out very specific projects. And I think, I covered all of them, but let me just make sure. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, I think that's all of the questions. It's popping back in. Uh, yeah, I think you, you handled all the questions and I wanted before we, we close on time uh, to say thank you again for your year really encouraging and um, informative uh, keynote. I feel very energized and I have a notebook full of things to follow up on. That's awesome.